morning from the new forest, another fine sunny day. We're inside today because we're going to be doing a little bit of back garden bird watching. We've got a camera on the feeder outside, but at this point, we've got a bird in the hand. Worth two in the bush, although the ones in the bush are probably in a better place because I hit this great bit up this morning. It was beneath the feeder, not looking too well. I'm not sure whether it flew into the window or it was ailing in some way. But it seems quite feisty and I've given it the once over. No broken limbs, wings are intact, tail's intact. Um, so I've had it now for about an hour and it seems, well, seems to say it's okay. So I'm going to go and put it outside. I'll tell you what, just quite before well. I do that, Beautiful, isn't it? It's stunning. I mean, having a bird in the hand is just an amazing thing. Get a close look at these animals. Um, I mean, that iridescent almost on the black of the top of its head. It's just stunning. It's beautiful. It's I'll stunning. tell you one other interesting thing about the great tip before I release it, and that is that some relatively recent science has shown that their beak has grown in length since 1970. So, there's a look great in the UK and great tips in the next. Now in the UK we spend between 350 and 360 million pounds a year feeding the birds in our garden. Globally that's billions. It's a billion pound industry globally, isn't it? Yeah, it it's is. It's huge. I think I'm spending a considerable part of that feeding <laughs> the birds in New Forest here. But on the continent in Western Europe, collectively in all of those countries, they spend somewhere between 150 and 160 million pounds. So we're spending twice as much as our cousins across the water there. So I apologize if you're watching this from continental Europe, you might well be feeding your birds, but your neighbors aren't feeding them as much. And we think that this is why the great tit's beak has grown in length by a fraction of a millimeter in that time. When bird ringers catch these birds, they measure quite a lot of the biometrics. They measure their wing length, they measure their beak length, they weigh them, of course. And by looking at all of this data over this long period of time, we've seen that the UK great tip has grown a longer bill than its continental cousins. And we think that is because so many people are feeding them in their gardens that it's giving them an advantage when they're reaching into those feeders, pecking at the peanuts, or the sunflower hearts, or something like that. So what we've seen with this species in the space of the last 40 years is evolution in action to the benefit of the great tip in the UK, which can better reach its food. Amazing. Amazing evolution stuff. in action. I know. What about Incredible. that? Incredible. Anyway, look, let's all wish this little bird the very best of health. I'm going to take it and put it outside now. We've got the dogs in. Um, and I'm going to put it outside next. You can yeah, see how it goes. Self isolation, yeah, of course. So of course, you know, recently we've got the news that we're all staying um, to the strip, more strictly inside. Um, I hope you guys are all doing okay and, and managing, uh, managing with that. All right. Of course, it's really, really difficult. And I've been reading through lots of the comments on these posts, and it's been. Um, really lovely to see that you know it's, these posts are helping a lot of people but in particular there's a lot of NHS staff that are watching and personally I want to say like a big 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 thank you to you seriously I mean without the work that you guys do you know it, oh, it's just invaluable isn't it and I mean my mum is a she's a specialist nurse so she's a um she works for the sleep clinic she helps children and adults with narcolepsy and things like that but she's going to be called back into the wards pretty soon um, and of course, that brings a whole host of various other things. She's got my little brother who's 11 years old. So we've got to um, kind of make sure that you know, either I can be there to look after him or someone can be there to look after him so that she can continue to do the vital work that she does. Um, it's really challenging. It's an uncertain time for so many. Um, and I think uh, it's scary, to be totally honest. It's pretty scary. And I know that you've you know, heard about Chris's father and uh, all these different people, but we're all in the same boat and we're all going through this together. And I think what's come out of this, I've been, in, you know, incredibly amazed by the community spirit of it all. People really willing to help one another. Hello, Nancy. Um, 
and it's yeah it's that's been a really heartwarming aspect but of course self-isolation it's a, a thing that I mean I've never experienced most of us have never experienced so it's um daunting isn't it to say the least a bit daunting. Although a great tip flew off up into the tree it was quite weakly flighted um but it uh it sat up in the bush outside now I'll keep an eye on it uh, throughout the rest of the morning hope it's okay oh great spotted great spotted great spotted yeah. Rebecca oh, oh. Hopefully you guys got a good view of that. I think it was right by the camera. It's really cool. Amazing. So, before we get onto the feed, we ought to just do our skull of the day. Skull of the day. Skull of the day. And it's 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 a much smaller skull today. Here we are. So it's a much smaller skull. It's tiny. It's as big as a thumb. It's a thumbnail. It's profile. It's face on. There it is. Let me just turn it around so you can see it from the top. So, here we are. Skull of the day. And it is a, a relevant species. And the only clue I'll give you is look at the bill. When it comes to small birds like this, there's not a lot of clues to go on, really. Shape of the back of the cranium, I suppose, but the bill is the key thing. So. Always the most important thing. You get lots of information from the shape of the bill. Yeah. So, um, you know, you might be able to figure out what food it eats and therefore what habitat it might be in and uh, get a lot of information that way. Um, but yeah, our, I mean, our bird feeder has been pretty busy <laughs> the last few weeks, so we thought we'd set up a second camera, um, and, and the birds have been getting used to the frame over the last couple of days, so that we were able to put the second camera out there without disturbing them too much. And uh, they're, they're a little bit flighty, so we're trying to stay really kit still in the kitchen because they can see us and they can hear us. Um, but they're coming in pretty pretty strong, aren't they? Yeah, lots of great activity here. They've got several nest boxes up in the garden. No already in and out of those. Uh, blue tits, of course. And in the winter, the various bird surveys, and particularly the RSPB's fantastic uh, back garden bird watch, which they do every January, has told us, look, there's mushed it, mushed it, on the feeder now. That's an amazing thing. Beautiful look little bird. Beautiful, stunning, bird. beautiful black head, that chestnut. Oh, it's stunning. Oh, that's, I'm really pleased about that. That's one species that... I wanted everyone to see because they're not as frequent as they used to be. They're a bird that oh, likes nice. to nest in wet woodland and the woodland around us at the moment is very wet after the mm. winter so they have a neat little call at this time of year when you're out as well. They go pichu, pichu, mm. pichu. It's um, nice. Getting back to the blue tits though, uh, which along with the great tits are very abundant. They, they occur in more than 90% of our gardens during the winter time when the feeders are at their busiest. And we have about 2 million pairs of blue tit in the UK. And um, they are essentially uh, a woodland species, which has moved into our gardens. So we call our gardens sort of marginal habitat, but effectively, of course, we're replacing some of that natural food that they would hope to find mm. out in the woods with our stuff that we put in the feeders. We've got sunflower huts in this one. Just amazing. I mean, I was reading up on a study <clears throat> just last night, and it's a really recent paper all about great tits and the effect that we have, our anthropogenic pollution, our human pollution has on these birds um, in terms of their activity patterns. And often when we look at pollution, we look at different types of pollution separately we might look at light pollution <clears throat> and then we might look at noise pollution and um, but this study has kind of combined the two together to see how that relationship between those two different types of pollution impacts the activity levels of these birds and interesting what they found is that with the combined effect of um increased uh light pollution uh, artificial light pollution and, uh, and noise as well, they found that um, the activity during the day increased by approximately two hours. So um, birds were going out and foraging and, and singing and being a lot more active for a lot longer. Um, but it also meant that in the, the, in the morning, in the beginning of the day, the activity uh, budgets were reduced, partially because of this light and noise pollution, um, whereby they've uh, kind of exhausted themselves from this extra two hours. So actually, our, our pollution is impacting the way that these birds are behaving. Um, now, what I thought was interesting about that is we know that with all of us um, indoors at the moment, there's going to be a lot less light pollution and a lot less noise pollution, particularly in urban areas. So perhaps if you guys have bird feeders in your garden and you live in an urban area, 
I mean, look out for that. Just maybe take note of when these birds are arriving at the feeders and when they're leaving. See if their activity patterns are, you know, slightly adapt over this time because it potentially could, couldn't they? Mm. Which is a really interesting project to, to do potentially with your kids or well, just by yourself. I mean, I know I'm going to be doing it. I'll be fascinated to see how their behaviour changes as, you know, we're not as noisy and we're not as... um. Producing as much light. On this side of the feeder, which is unfortunately the opposite side of the oh, camera, there, we had um, yeah, you can see uh, the bottom. we had cold tip came in there, which was well. Wow. So we've got blue tip, great tip, marsh tip, and cold tip coming in at the moment. Mm. What we've seen in the last few days, literally the last few days, is a massive fall off in the number of green finches and goldfinches. Just a couple of days ago, this feeder at this time would have been smuggled in goldfinches. But I think this warm weather has triggered their desire to fly off and and breed and although we put plenty of food out for goldfinches there's not any nesting habitat immediately close by here so we seem to have disappeared we're getting one or two goldfinches there's cold hit again just flipping in and out seems to like this side of the feeder you'll notice that on the right hand side there i've got the feeder near that laurel tree um and that's a deliberate thing not planting the laurel tree that was here when i moved but but putting the feeder there because the birds really like cover close to the feeder so that they can sit in the feeder uh, in the cover in that laurel tree watch to see when there's a space available on the feeder fly in do their bit and then fly back to the security of that laurel uh, we have a sparrow hawk that comes through a couple of times a day and um, cats of course but um the but the security of that tree is really important so when you are placing a feeder if you put it right in the middle of your garden away from any natural shelter, it's not going to be as popular. Mm. It's about getting the balance right. You don't want to get put it too close to the things so that if you do have a cat or your neighbours have cats, they can reach it. But the birds need to be within striking distance of it. The little marsh tit is spending quite a bit of time on the ground, unfortunately, mm. out of view. But hopefully that will pop back on again in a minute. It's just amazing, isn't it? even just sitting and watching for just. Oh, there, there it is. Okay, it's around the back. It's on our side. Oh, oh it's coming out. Like, can you see? You can see oh. Ted. Oh, oh, there we go. No, you had a little bit of a sight there. Bit of and then another one. There must be more than one because another bird yeah. came in very quickly after that one. And there's a goldfinch. A goldfinch. Yeah. Goldfinch is great. I love goldfinches. That beautiful red and that yellow part. I think they're just stunning little birds, aren't they? Well, do you know what? They're a bit too gaudy for me. Oh, no. No, no, I much prefer the subtlety of the marsh tip. You like bold colours. You like your 80s retro and all that kind of I stuff. I do, I do. But I mean, is that, what's more retro than a gold? You know, a bit beaver with all of those sort of different colours. But they're too complicated, the colour patterns. Maybe. They look like someone's given an outline right, of a bird of a, uh, uh, to a young to a child, child, child that sets out to it. So so to try to use every colour in their flight all over your body. body. That, 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 that was a project for you. You could draw the outline of a finch if you have young children and ask them to design their own oh. finch, come up with a name for it, and then send it in to us. And we'll have right. a, a, a new finch species on our little broadcast. I love that. That'd be great. That, that would be good. But just getting back to your light pollution, mm. I know that you mentioned there's a negative aspect there with the great tips. Yeah. Um, but when they've looked at wading birds, uh, red shanks, um, and certainly when they've been foraging on mud near power stations, which are constantly illuminated, ferry ports, and those mm. sorts of things, they found that it's been an asset to them. Because some of those birds are still using, you know, some use their beaks to feel for their prey down in the mud. But a lot, a lot of them are actually looking for things as well. And red shanks are one of those op optical hunters. And because of, they can see at night effectively they're not so dependent on the tide and the light so they're getting the best of both worlds and the red, the red shanks were prospering for the light pollution in this particular site it's interesting isn't it then because you could do also like a cross species reference with these different groups of birds and see exactly not just about their activity patterns but you know the success of their foraging as well that would be funny research is i mean we can do that <laughs> okay we're creating scientific studies now Pan on thing in the car today, which I haven't done for the last, uh, oh, I can't remember actually, um, a long, long time. You can clean my car as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Look, just getting on to the, uh, yeah. bit, well, what you can see if you do set up a feeder like this close to your window, keep it nice and still. I've got the results of 2019's RSPB um, Big Garden Bird Watch, and uh, number one, the house sparrow, which sadly we never have here at all, 
Number two, the starling. We only have those in winter. Number three, the blue pit. As I mentioned, most people in the UK have those. Four, blackbird. Five, wood pigeon. Now, when I was a kid, you know, way back in the 1960s, early 70s, we, ne we never used to get wood pigeons in the garden. They would come and pitch in the trees, but they were too scared to come down. And they've seen a sort of a cultural change. So we've got chaffinch on the ground. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, number five was wood pigeon. Number six, goldfinch. Goldfinch has done really well, haven't they? In 2018, they were up by 11% on the big garden bird watch. Really? They were up by 11%, and they were one of the most common species seen in UK gardens. Wow. Yeah. And again, you know, when I was a kid, well, I keep going on about it. It was a long time ago. I can't remember it. Um, not, hatch. Hatch. not hatch. Not hatch. hatch around the corner. Off, right, slightly offside. Oh, oh, look at that. Hatch. You know, oh, come on, move around a little bit. He's on our side. Oh, come on. Come on, nut hatches. You know you want to. It's just <laughs> filling its filling its crop. Think about nut hatches is that they cache a lot of their food. Um, same as the marsh tits and grey tits, actually. One of the reasons the feeders are often so busy with those species is they're not eating all the food. They're flying in, taking it, and then hiding it somewhere in your garden. And every spring, we've got sunflowers popping up mm. around the garden where the seeds have germinated. That nut hatch is still sat on the wrong side of the it's feed. Having a good look around. I Come love on. a nut hatch. And if you're loving it, no one can see it. I know, I know. Stop oh. gloating. I'm at sorry. The, at the, at the I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm urging it. I'm urging it. No, it's just sat there <laughs> filling its face with, with, with sunflower hearts. Shall I get back to the list? Yes, go on. Okay. Oh, it's gone. It's gone. Well, hopefully when it comes back to the other side. Right. Okay, number seven was Great Tit, number eight, Robin, number mm -hmm. nine, Chaffinch, up one place, it says here. And then number ten, interesting one from mm -hmm. the back, uh, Big Back Garden Bird Watch, number ten was Magpie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Magpie. So, very interesting that Magpies are, I mean, they're not common enough for bird, but in enough gardens to be number ten in the 2019 Big Garden Bird Watch, which also said the RSPB are doing uh, a breakfast bird watch between 8.30 and 9 every morning. And you can find details of that on the RSPB website or, of course, by following. Not hatch, come on! <laughs> oh, a sneaky little. Oh, well, you can just see it peeking around the side. Peek, oh, and it's flown off. It's a little peeking. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Um, Twitter tag is at uh, nature's voice um so check out the rspb doing their yeah, breakfast really with the deep. birds as well which is which is great oh, okay great spot it's on the roof it's on stand, the roof stand, 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 don't finish okay come on oh, oh, guess what it flew off it's flown to new zealand <laughs> i mean that's how far it went <laughs> Mace, you've got some stuff that people have sent in. Yeah, of course. So um, at the moment, we are using our two phones to stream these live to you. So when we're doing them, we can't always see the live comments coming in. But I went through them last night and I picked out um, a few various different comments that and questions that people had. And um, so I'm going to start off with Nicola Jones. Um, I think Fabian, who's the amazing man behind the screen, is going to put up a photo of the image that she sent in. Um, she said, what is the name of this plant? I think I've got a... a here as well just in case what is the name of this plant they've sprung up all over my garden over the last couple of years and the bees seem to love them well i didn't know what this plant was but i did a bit of research no but it's called the common great highest hyacinth can we get the pronunciation right um it's obviously called the common grape hyacinth because it looks like a cluster of, of grapes it's really vivid purple and that's of course very attractive um, to lots of pollinators and if you look really carefully on that image, on the, um, the bottom right-hand side of that, you can see up here, there is a solitary hair-footed flower bee. So these um, hairy-footed flower bees are often confused with bumblebees because they look very similar. But you can tell them apart because these solitary bees are a lot more zigzaggy. They almost move like a bit like a hoverfly. So you can tell by the way that they move um, exactly what species they are. And actually, they're one of the first indicators that spring has arrived because they are one of the first bees to be seen to emerge in springtime. Um, but I think that, that the individual in that flower there is a male. Um, that's because it's this kind of golden honey colour. The females are a lot darker. They tend to be um, quite black. 
So um, yes, yeah, so that's the name of the, the plant for you. It's the common grape hyacinth, and that insect on it is a solitary hairy footed flower. It's not a native species, though. I think that's a garden, no. a garden species. And no. if it's coming to the garden, it's escaped from one of her neighbours. Potentially, but they're quite common actually in UK gardens. Are they? Yeah. I mean, I've seen them. I have seen them before, but they're gorgeous, you know, aren't they? because they weren't native, I didn't pay too much attention, and I didn't know what it was. Well, yeah. Um, and then uh, there was another question from Sarah Lampard. In fact, you've kind of answered this already. Cool. Um, not many birds on the feeders just now. Is this because they're courting? Or do I have a sparrowhawk visiting? Um, well, like you said, if there's not a lot of nesting areas for them in your, in your garden, they'll fly away after mm -hmm. they've uh, had their fill and they've built up their fatty reserves enough that they can breed successfully. Uh, and they'll go off and uh, they'll, they'll mate and start laying their eggs and incubating their eggs, won't they? Yeah, I think mean, mm -hmm. that's what it is. I mean, sparrowhawks come through, but they're not, they're not there all day. Um, and Actually, within a minute of the sparrowhawk coming through the garden and you know, on a mission, the birds are back on the feeder. So they only disappear very quickly when the predator comes through like that. Yeah, very cool. Um, and then the next question is Amanda Pogg. It's not so much a question, but I think it's really cool. Um, so she has spotted her first adder of the year. So adders, they are the most northerly member of the viper family. Um, I think they're amazing. Did you know that? I didn't know this, but you can find them in the Arctic Circle yeah, in Scandinavia. Yeah. Scandinavia. I didn't know that. That's really, really cool. But yeah. you can always tell an adder because it's got that really distinctive zigzaggy pattern. It's got that brown and that black colour. And then it's got dark spots all along the, uh, the side of its body as well. Now, they'll be kind of coming out of hibernation um, in kind of late February. They hibernate between October and February. Um, and then they will start to breed. April, May time. So keep an eye out for, for adders. They like typically open areas um, of habitat. They, they don't often see them too much in gardens, but if you're out over in the heathland and areas like that, keep an eye on the ground because you might see basking adder. Which Especially is first really thing in the morning cool. when they're coming out to warm up. Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment, that would be between, uh, I'd say, seven and eight would be the best time to see them. After that, they get, they get too hot and slim off. Um, so next question is from Paul Nuffel, who sent us a couple of photos of sparrowhawks. Uh, I've got one of the images here. You can see kind of this is the back of the head of the sparrowhawk, and it's got two distinct spots on it. Um, and Paul's question is, anyone know if the two white marks are unique to this individual, or are they found on the whole species? So these white spots are actually um, very common. They're found in the whole species. In fact, it's normally a white band on the top of their head. Particularly in the female. Particularly in the yeah, female. Yeah, you see it really clearly in the female. Um, but this, this individual has two white spots. That's probably due to individual variation in their coloration. So normally it would be a white band, but this individual seems to have two white spots, which is pretty cool. The question is, what are they there for? Do you know what? I have got no, I have no idea. Well, right. I, mean, I mean, in some bird species, so some of the owl species, they have eyes, mm -hmm. eyes type marking. I'm thinking of, uh, I think it's pearl spotted owl, it's an African species that I've seen. So none of the UK species, but some of the uh, uh, overseas owl species have eye markings on the back of their head. And they're constantly getting mobbed by small birds during the daytime. And I guess that gives them a double the opportunity to look intimidating. Yeah. They can do it with their real eyes and they've got the eye markings. But why the sparrowhawk has them on the back of its head like that? It might be mm -hmm. something, I mean, you know, I can't remember seeing them as prominently in young sparrowhawks, but it could be something which continues to develop as the bird becomes more mature. It's quite mm -hmm. subtle, given that the male sparrowhawk changes its plumage dramatically from uh, its, its juvenile plumage into its adult plumage. But there's got, in nature, if there's something there, there's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. Nature know, knows no redundancy. So, Basically, there will be a reason. If anyone knows, of course, yes, that would be yeah. great. And there are one yeah. or two really good sparrowhawk experts in the UK. Dr. Ian Newton mm -hmm. studied them for a long time. Nick Marquis, again, has done some really good work with sparrowhawks. Lots of people, actually. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, please do let us know, because I'd love to understand that a little bit better. Yeah. Um, and then the, the next question is from Ransom Photography. This was on Twitter. Uh, he sent through this image. Um, the question was, um, I've been watching these blue tits on these flowers in my garden and they appear to be feeding inside the flower. Are they after the bugs or drinking the nectar? Um, so this flower, I did a bit of research again <laughs> on this one. This is called a Japanese, uh, how do you pronounce Pyrrhus? Yeah, I'm yeah, really rubbish at my pronunciation. I can Japanese never pronounce Pyrrhus, sorry, yeah, we're not, I'm not, I'm not a gardener. No, I'm, so I'm, I'm we're not shocking my pronunciation, am I? Well, not well, well, pronunciation, but I mean, I didn't know yeah, what this was yeah, either, I but... But it's not a native species, it's yeah. native to China and Taiwan, um, 
but it does grow in some of our gardens. And those birds you will see kind of uh, hovering in and out of those flowers, flying around, and they will be picking up the insects from inside those flowers. So the insects will be coming in to take the pollen uh, and potentially get a bit of protection, but these birds will come in to pick up, pick up the insects that are, that are um, inside, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, so it's a really important food resource, obviously, all these different types of insects. So um, they're going to be attracted to this kind of pink coloration on this flower, on this Japanese purists <laughs> and, um, and then the birds are obviously going to be attracted to that so yeah what I'd say is going on there what work um and then I'd like to say uh to Matt Wilkinson he sent us a photograph of a bee fly and um, he didn't realize I think you did a, a Facebook live didn't you about primroses and the relationship of primroses to bee flies and, and because of that like he went out exploring in his garden and he took a photo of a bee fly next to some primroses so um yeah Stunning animals, absolutely Amazing. stunning. Well worth a sit sit down if you've got primroses, you know, in, in any abundance. Sit down for five or ten minutes, and if you're lucky, a bee fly, one of those bee fly species, yeah. might drop in. They're quite they're fast. They zip about, but they're certainly distinctive. You look at their very very long proboscis. Should we wrap up the skull quiz? Let's wrap up the skull quiz. Okay, Get your so answers in if you haven't already. Very very quickly. Yeah. So basically. Um, <laughs> One of, the, one of these birds has come into the feeder, it came in very quickly and then left again. So here's the skull, today's skull of the day. Uh, it's a finch and look, it hasn't got that narrow needle point bill that the goldfinch has for teasing out the seeds from thistles and, and teasels and, and, and uh, other plants like that. So this has got a much bigger rootish bill. It's not big enough and brutish enough to be a hawfinch. This isn't a bill that's breaking open cherry stones and so on and so forth. So that narrows it down to chaffinch and greenfinch. And if you look at the top of the shape of the bill there, again, it's broader and taller at the base than that of a chaffinch. So this is a greenfinch skull. And I was hoping that we'd get more than just the one that's popped in. But um, Fleeting glimpse. greenfinch skull, yeah. Mm -hmm. Really difficult to prepare these little skulls from any you know, dead greenfinch that we find. Requires a degree of um, patience and uh, so so delicate. Yeah, they're very very so delicate. They're so lightweight. Hard hard to do. So lightweight. Anyway, look. The um, thing is, the the uh, we're going to develop things tomorrow because we're going to we're going to have a guest. So we're going to be here in the new forest, but then we'll also be going to Gary Moore, who will be doing bird song in his back garden uh, down in Bath. So we'll have an introduction from the new forest, mm -hmm. and then we'll go to birdsong in the new in in Bath with with Gary Moore. It's going to be amazing. If you've She's seen Gary excellent. Moore on the watches or anything like that, he is just simply fantastic. So if you want to kind of understand a bit more about birdsong, or maybe you're you know a beginner trying to figure out which bird is which from your window or out in your garden, Gary's oh, man. he is the man. Gary's man. Gary's so, brilliant. He's going to do whatever he hears, and then he's going to cover some common bird song that we're all hearing at the moment. So before we go, I'm just going to run through the list of what we've had. We've had great tit, blue tit, cold tit, marsh, marsh tit. We had chaffinch on the ground. Sorry about that, couldn't see that one. We had greenfinch there as well. We had nuthatch come in, and we had great spotted woodpecker coming, but not to the feeder. Oh, we did. Did it that yeah, briefly? briefly? It bounced on and off. It? It that's bit. right. It bounced you on and off. Fleeting Anything <laughs> else? So that's. Um, yeah, eight, eight species. Do we have anything else to go? I think, I think, so. I think that was it. I think we covered it. Oh, well, nice to see though. I mean, a, a real joy just to stand here for half an hour, look out and see all of these birds just a few metres away. Didn't need the binoculars, did bring them down, didn't use them. So there we are. So now we've been talking about self isolating, and obviously, you know, Megs and I are great mates. And uh, what are you about to do? Well, you see, this is one of my socks. <laughs> I know where this is going. My socks. But Megan seems to be short of socks. And, and she <laughs> raids my drawer. And I, I don't like that. I, I don't like sharing. She really doesn't like that. Food. Um, I don't... Oh, great spotted. Oh, so there we go. Oh, there we go. Oh, Um, the key thing is, um, this sock is in isolation, <laughs> so I, I washed it, but I don't know where its friend is, 
I don't know where its best friend is, its partner. And this is because Megs has stuffed it somewhere and, and lost it. I haven't lost it. Self isolation is going to be putting a log on our relationship if you continue <laughs> to nip by sock. I hope you realise you've just started something now. Yeah, sock yeah. wars. So well, you've started something. Tomorrow I'll be coming back with something. Well, Something on your side. Do you know what? Strange to enough, I don't wear any of Megan's clothes at all. Are you anyway, sure? listen, we're going to have to walk the poodles, but also yesterday I made a short video of poodles in slow motion. Can't be that. I'm going to leave you with that today. Back at nine o'clock tomorrow with Gary Moore from Bath. It's going to be spectacular. We hope if we get all the technology working. So we'll see you again tomorrow. We'll see you then. I'll leave you with the slow mo poodles. They won't be in slow mo. I'll tell you, they're <laughs> charging around when we take them out. See you. Bye. Bye.